the first thing, we're going to talk the very basics of types of entries we have. And this is in the Transaction Plus, which is our accounting section. Um, we're talking about checks and deposits. Everybody's familiar with the check and deposit. They are used to enter your daily income and expense on a date cash exchange basis. Uh, there are standard and required fields. Um, and then you have your optional fields that you can fill in as well. Um, Your standard fields or required fields are obviously the ledger account number. I mean, sorry, sorry, the checking account, what number it is, which is a ledger account. Checking account is a ledger account. The date, the vendor, the dollar amount, the ledger account, the center, and the division. Um, the optional fields are based on the uh, type of a ledger account you have, but you can have like quantity description, long description, weight, whatever is applicable. To that ledger account you picked. Um, optional functions can be printed. Uh, you can be pr printing a check. A little check mark box will show it in a minute. A print a check, clear entry, save as macro, and toggle on the scanner. So you can choose to print your checks. Uh, there's a check mark box. Every time you hit save, it's going to print the check. Uh, there's a check mark box up there for clear entry, which means you can it'll always clear the entry with the date of the entry, which you do not really want to do if you're ever going to reconcile to a bank statement. So I don't recommend that box, because if you do that, then it's just a reconciling to a bank. And then you have save as macro. Um, if you've not heard the term macro, what a macro means is that if you have an entry that you pay frequently, it's one way to look at it. Like if you have utility bill, it's always broken down the same way every month, the same ledger accounts, the same different centers. You might want to save that so you don't have to remember it. So you save a macro and it automatically populates those lines on the ledger account, center division, dollar amounts for you. Again, so you don't have to remember every month how to do it. Also great for those entries you only do once a year that you don't remember how to do. You save a macro for, for annual entries, and again, it populates um, everything down the bottom as far as ledger, center, division, um, so you don't have to remember how you did it last year. And then we also have the option, um, our scanning module, which is an add-on to Transaction Plus where you can attach PDFs, JPEGs to an entry you have an option at the bottom of the screen that says toggle scanner. So when you hit save on your entry, it's going to ask you to scan an image and attach it to your, your accounting entry. I have a, so I have a question. This is kind of going backwards a little bit. Not hearing you talk about mm -hmm. uh, the fact that the, a data entry point, you have, to, you have to select a division. This mm -hmm. is what I'm going to go at, what I'm getting at. In terms of the reporting or the way the software handles a, a center versus a division, mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, what is the advantage of saying, okay, I'm going to make this a division instead of just saying I'm going to make it a center? You could have several, I don't want to say that. It's another level, obviously, but you could have put to general, more general centers and still have a division that's the same in all your entries. So, um, Maybe you have two crop divisions. You have owned land and rented land, and you want to be able to do that. So you have all your crop input purchases as a, as a ledger account, and maybe you have your center for corn production, 19, and then your division is owned or rented land. So then you can run a report on only owned land and all your expenses and income, and you can run them for just on your rented land if you want to separate it like that. So centers can actually go between divisions. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. You can use the same center for different divisions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, maybe on. Try to think what else. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can lock bank accounts to divisions. You can if you have separate so bank accounts. If you have a separate banking entities for. But divisions have kind of become less effective in our software over the years, especially with the advent of LLCs and different companies. Uh, a lot of clients in the old days used to have it all in one three-letter initial database and just separated by division, but it also gets a little confusing trying to track assets within one three-letter initial da database. Uh, and, and so with that and the LLC uh, liabilities, then in most cases we just start seeing one division. Okay. 
yeah, you don't, you don't see very many many different divisions. You really don't. So you're saying when they have a if they have a separate entity, a completely separate tax entity, then it's just a separate company. Yep. Company, separate, yep. separate yep. books. And it's less confusing. Yeah. 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 You, you don't write cross postings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They ask that way. So we're just going to quickly look at the check screen. Checks and deposit screens look very similar, so we'll just go to one of them. And we just looked at this little big up here in the last session. So here's the check mark I was talking about for cleared entries, printing checks, saving entry as a macro. Um, so the, the macro again here is um, it automatically populated everything down here at the bottom in my ledger account. Usually they'd be more than one line. They don't, they don't have to be. If you have more than one line, it does save the ratio of the different lines, so you can change the dollar amounts. Um, it does like pretty pretty easily there. Um, down here at the bottom, we have the buttons like I was talking about the toggle scanner. It adds that save plus scan. If I clicked on that when I saved the entry again, it would, I'm not hooked up to a scanner, so I can't. But it would I could click scan and it would uh, bring a document from the scanner show the image here and if I liked it I'd hit save and it would attach it to that document. Okay so is that what you were talking about when you were talking yesterday? Mm -hmm. So if I pull up the check and I just want to know a little bit or I want to see the invoice attached to the check I just hit the check and I hit the button it just pops up my invoice from yep. there. Yep. Okay. It does. Yep. Sorry. No that's no that's you're perfectly fine. It's exactly what that does. I'm here up at the top. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No. What if you get the invoice via email and it's already in some sort of digital format? You can, you can still attach it. You wouldn't attach it on this screen. What you would do is there's a certain naming procedure we do and you save it to your invoices folder. And then there's a screen um, over here. And it would so it would show up as an unlinked invoice over in this yellow box. And I could choose then to attach it to something on this screen. So with the email, you save the invoice mm -hmm. into this file, mm -hmm. and then you come here. Okay. Yep. And you can attach it. Yep. So here's what I was talking about. If you had different bank accounts, the very first field you have here, you can pick which bank account you are using. Then you have your check numbering. Um, I always have a question if it's not a check number, what do I put in there? So if like ACH, I put ACH in the date, or some people use EFT, electronic fund transfer, and the date up there in that check number. I still would use that for putting some kind of designation on the entry, um, but it doesn't have to specifically be a check number. Um, our system will say the last checker number you used. Sometimes it's hard because you're handwriting checks and you're printing checks, so you can, usually there's a lot of typing in that field just to keep up with what, what your check number is but you, um, you can do that. Your date is here. You can always type in the date or you can go to the calendar and pick a date off the calendar and put it in. Um, to your date field, again, we have our vendor list. We talked about vendor list, total amounts. And this is your, uh, your net amount for your check. So you could have multiple lines here as long as they have to add up to that check amount. So that could be $200 to that. And then we can have multiple lines that have to add up then to that $500. So maybe that was $700 and that nets then, because of the type of ledger account, and nets to the 500. Um, it won't let you save a check until this amount of balance is in green, which means that these lines down here have to add up to my total amount of the check. Same with the deposit, your lines down here have to match up to the total amount of the check. So you might have, you know, on, de um, on a deposit, maybe you had some expenses in there that, you know, you had a rent check, but then you had some reimbursed expenses that brought your it down to the net amount of the deposit. So it works the same way on the on the deposit screen as the check screen. So I mentioned you don't want to clear the check up here at the checkbox because it clears it with the date of the check or deposit, which means you can't reconcile to your bank. So then the question comes up, then how do I clear checks and deposits? And uh, there are a couple ways. Like I said, you, you can check that box and I don't recommend that because you can't reconcile to your statement. Um, you can clear any check or deposit 
uh, from the clear check and deposit screen and that screen is enter input and then clear checks and deposits and you pick a date range you pick a bank account um, has the option to clear with yes or no again that clears it with a check date you won't be able to reconcile to a check statement um, but using that so I don't check that box um, if you check this box here and include cleared entries uh, it will allow you to put in an ending bank balance so you can see on this screen if you reconcile to the bank um, right now I'm gonna leave that unchecked and click uh, okay so then this screen comes up and you can go through it lists all your checks deposits um, the date and the vendor and dollar amount and you can go through here and put in the clear date so if these were clearing today I just type in 19 um, and they can come if it's the same date for several of them you hit F3 and it will clear and, and you can click around you know say those you know four didn't clear I come back down this one did clear with the today's date you can clear with the actual date obviously or you can clear with the date of the statement you're trying to reconcile to you scroll through and you um, everything that's cleared you put a clear date in and you hit save and then then they're cleared entries if I put included the cleared entries on this other screen and the actual ending bank balance, it would say here at the bottom and tell me how it puts I into the ending bank balance if I'm if I'm matching my statement or not. Why That's, is it important to have the date cleared? To reconcile to bank statements. So I have a date cleared in here. And this might answer your question a little bit better. Which means that I can come to my uh, Check reconciliation report and I uncheck my box so it says and we'll go over this in the next one too a little bit more but the date range uses check date. If I check that box it lists all my checks in the date by date they were written but uncheck this box it lists them by date clear so it makes it a reconciliation report instead of a register. So here my date clear shows up here, so I have my cleared balance, and my cleared balance should match my bank balance that the bank sends me in my bank statement. Um, but then it shows all, everything that is uncleared here as well. From this screen though, as you can also, so if I said, oh, I missed this Conklin Dairy Cattle, that one actually did clear, I could right click on it and put in my clear date here. Yep, it cleared to date. Save it, refresh the report, now that one's cleared and it changes my cleared bank balance at the bottom to reconcile to the bank. Um, so you ran this, everything cleared, your check should match your statement, your deposit should match your statement, and then your balance should match your statement as well as your beginning balance. And that's how you reconcile to your bank. Had I just said clear it upon entry, then my clear date for like 4D land company would be 53119. So I would never match my August bank statement. It would never show up there. You, what, the only closest we can come to that is if you can get your bank statement in Excel format from your bank and then you edit that Excel form putting in FBS ledgers, centers, and divisions. Because oh. <laughs> okay. it has to know what ledger, center, and division to For put sure. it to. Um, and those have to, um, the vendors, um, they don't have to match, but it's nice if you have your vendors matching. But they will bring it in then, though. If you if you want to add ledgers and centers and divisions to that Excel from your bank, you can import that in um, instead of hand typing that in. Just just kind of depends on which is easier to pick it from a drop down and typing everything in, or just right. typing in typing in that. It doesn't work as well for like multi line. Like if you have like the, the bank won't break it down by different categories. So it'd say five thousand dollars, and maybe you have. If you were hand typing it and that would be four, five, six, seven different ledger accounts, that would be very difficult to do from that bank. And that's kind of why we haven't went that way. I know they are kind of looking into possibly doing something like that, um, but the biggest roadblock is, well, it's one dollar amount, you have to add several lines to break that down to what ledger accounts and centers divisions that goes into. And, the, and on top of centers and divisions, if it's expensed to a certain crop project or livestock group, you have to add in the group IDs and stuff like that sure. as well. Okay. 
and then it comes down which is which is more time consuming. Right. <laughs> it's something we've definitely thought about. <laughs> okay. So after you have um, checks and deposits, we have them have options of journal entries and adjustment entries. Journal entries are your two-sided entries. They are balanced entries that transfer funds between accounts. So it can be transferring funds between ledger accounts, between separate centers, or separate divisions. Um, and this also allows you to make entries at different accounting levels. So we have the cash tax, we have financial, we have marketing, and we have managing, management journal entries. So if you were wanting to move for, uh, you know, marketing purposes, you were you did you want to move your make adjustment in your asset value for your equipment to marketing values instead of um, non depreciated asset value. You could make some journal entries if you wanted to um, move entries from um, expenses to like crops and process or growing crops. You can make journal entries type of entries that if you had Eclipse assistant makes on for you to make you know, your balance sheet show those those assets instead of expenses you can make using journal entries um, the key is they are balanced entries they should if they they won't let you save until they're balanced um, you cannot save an unbalanced journal entry which means it keeps your balance sheet in balance an adjustment entry is a one-sided entry they should be used very very sparingly by um, an un usually only under the advice of a trained accountant because they are one-sided and they are unbalanced. I have used or recommended adjustment entries less than a handful of times in 10 years. Usually, everyone's like, well, I just need to put a number in to clean up my balance sheet. I know, I know why it's off. And I still recommend going back to the root of that problem, figuring out why it got unbalanced, fixing it, and going forward. But there are some people who they just they don't want to do that and they just want to just want to clean it up and at that point you can use a, an adjustment entry um, to bring stuff back in balance. But it, it is a one-sided entry and if you're using it for any other purpose than to bring back in balance, it will put you out of balance. So I just I don't recommend them very very often, but they are there when when the need arises for them. Okay. Um, the first four entries I talked are your basic entries. They are available to everybody who has Transaction Plus. They are the base entries. Um, there is the Accounts Payable and Accounts Receivable module, and there are two separate ones. Account, you can have just Accounts Payable, you can have just Accounts Receivable. Um, these are add-on modules. I just want to be clear about that. They, that they are add-ons. Um, but these are for your short-term entries. Um, I'm, I put this in here because I see accounts payable and receivable are short term. They should usually be less than six months, at the longest maybe a year. If you have something open longer than a year, it's a loan to you or to them. <laughs> it's a loan. It needs to be moved to a, a note, <laughs> receivable or payable, instead of an accounts payable or receivable. Um, and the reason I really stress this is because you have them open for so long and FBS's default is to look at four months back. You can set it up to 72 months. We, we have kept increasing that to make things work for people, but the problem is, is it comes down to FBS has a Microsoft database for each year, 19, 2000 year, 19, 18, you know, whatever year it is, with all the entries saved in it. So if you create an accounts payable in 2017 and you don't go pay it until 2019, it has to read two databases and link those back up by vendor and an and invoice number and it connects those two entries but it doesn't do it really well because you're going over separate Microsoft Access databases and there's just issues of linking when you get beyond a year on top of accounting practice it's not good accounting practice so there's two reasons not good accounting practice and the system just sometimes throws little fits if you have them open if you're running this you know, a few months over, um, obviously things do go across uh, input years. That's not a big deal, but I've seen some that are six years old, accounts payable and account receivable, and that's just not not good at all. But you can put accounts payables and receivables. They go in very similar to a check or deposit. You do have additional reports for showing aging um, and open accounts and closed, you know, pay, paid accounts and open accounts, and, and you can reconcile your vendor statements. And they're very useful if you're running a cash versus accrual, 
County. Um, we'll just show up in the accounts receivable here. Again, the screens, accounts payable receivable look very similar to check and deposits. The only addition is your due date here and the amount paid in number. You never fill in account, account amount paid in number. The system fills those in when you pay them or receive them, but you can change the due date. It does allow you to put numbers down here, but if you put a number down here and you haven't actually paid or received it, it's gonna mess up your balance due. I don't know, that's kind of, it's on my list to have them fix it. So it hasn't been a big, big priority of the programmers to fix that. Um, and there are some times you have to change that, so I kind of see why they don't. But on entry, you can change the due date, but don't touch these boxes here. Okay. When you put an accounts payable or receivable entry in, you can then go in and you the way you receive them is you come to input AP and AR, and you have the option of paying an AP entry, printing AP check, AR money received, printing invoices, so on and so forth. if we have anything open, I don't remember. You pick a date range of when you wanna pay. You can pick a specific vendor if you're paying a specific vendor. I've picked all of them trying to find an open AP here. I didn't have any opens. I have to add an AP and then I'll show you how to pay it. Uh, when you're putting in APs and ARs, the main thing to remember as well is your invoice number for each vendor. You don't want to reuse invoice numbers for vendors. They have to be unique. So sometimes I even recommend using um, the date for the invoice number. And if it's the first one of the day, it's number one or 01. And if it's second, it's 02. And these are only vendors that were flagged as AP vendors in my vendor set. Can be any any ledger account. I'm gonna put a due date on this one of 2019. I'm gonna save it. Okay. So if I come here and pay, I can pick this ADM. Uh, my date range is May through the end of December, so I should pull it up. There can be more than one here. Invoices due. This one just has one, tells you total amount is 5,000. You can come here, you can partial payment, pay it, or you can choose not to pay it. So I could choose to pay $2,500 on it. And it's gonna come over to this page, it's gonna ask me what check do I wanna cut the check out of? What is my check number? What is the date on the check? If there's a discount, you can put the discount in and then the ledger center division you wanna associate with that discount. You can also put in a late charge and then what, char what ledger account do you want that expense put to, what center division? They have the option here to print the check or not print the check or mark it as printed. Um, so this is where if you were batch printing, you have AP, you choose not to print the check. At the end of the day, you go in and print all your AP checks, all your checks for the day at one time. So you're not constantly changing out your you know, check stock in your printer between that and plain paper. Question. Mm -hmm. So when you enter the invoice as, a, as a payable, mm -hmm. you're not at that point selecting centers or yeah you do mm -hmm. you, you you pick all that uh, the, uh, the ap all that's right here center so it's already there and then you have the chance that when you here you could just change it if you want no to. these are for the discounts so if i had a discount on this so i paid twenty five hundred dollars okay. but say i went i actually had um prepaid prepaid discount yeah like a prepaid like a, right. fifty dollars off Right. So you put that fifty dollars in here, but then you have to say what ledger account do I want that prepaid discount okay, to go to? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you have a discount and you have a late charge. So again, if you have a late charge, you put it to an expense account for fees, a prepaid, and maybe an income or an expense account. It could be a reimbursed expense or something like that, income or something like that. It's a good question, though. Okay. And then it writes it writes the check for the AP that screen. So you can come here to your AP detail reports or AR detail reports. They both work the same. Um, and I'm going to run this with option seven. It shows your invoice and then it shows any payments against that invoice. I didn't save that check so it didn't show it up here. 
Um, but this shows my open invoice. If there was any payments against it, it would show right underneath it here. So I could probably go back up here and pay that again. So here's the payment I made against it. So we have um, the first line is the original AP. Total amount was 5,000. The due date was 921. Um, but it shows over here the internal pay. I paid $2,500 on it. So down below we see that. We see in 821, I paid $2,500 against that invoice. Okay. Um, this report also tells you how many days it's been open. This was open for zero days because I put it in today. If there was an issue with a payment or an invoice, it would show up in orange. So if you see orange lines on here, it means something needs to be fixed. Sometimes you'll see just a check at the top, it'll say NA in, in, in the vendor or in the invoice. It's a payment that isn't linked to it uh, in the invoice. From this report, like any of our reports, if I want to look at this AP, I can right click on the AP line and it'll bring up the AP. I can edit the AP from this screen and do any changes I need to do on this screen for my AP entry. I can also right click on the check that paid it and bring up that check in the edit check screen. You can change anything on this except for the description. When you have a check that pays an AP or if you have a deposit that is received on an AR, the invoice number is saved in the description file, in the description field. If I were to change this description field in any way, it would unlink that payment from that invoice. It allows you to come in here and change it. But if I was to come in here you would, and change, take off the one and then resave this, it would no longer link. So I have two yellow lines because it, it, it knows it should be paid, but it can't find that check that paid it because I took that one off of there in that description changed the number so it doesn't match the invoice anymore and so it cannot find it. So you cannot change an invoice number in this field. Sometimes I can fix it by, re by putting that in but it is, at that time it did, it's justified in that box, the description box, and it makes it really hard sometimes to find the right spacing to get it to, to fix that number. The other reports you can run when you have accounts payable and receivable, I mentioned it was your aging reports, both AP and AR. Um, run it through the date range you want it to run for. And we can see here, I still have an ADM. I had $2,500 that is due. It's one to 30 days past due. Um, and there's this, this, this farms that has negative $142,000. You can right click on any of these and see the open APs and go into them screen as well. On the AP reports, you have an additional report called the cash requirement report. So if I was wanting to run through 831-2019, um, I could come here and see what invoices I had due by 831 of, of 19 um, and know what I might, how much cash I would need. On the flip side, on, instead of instead of a cash requirement report for for your ARs or accounts receivables, you have a um, a statement, so you can send out statements to your your vendors that you have outstanding ARs for. On your account receivable invoices, have you been able to get the long description to show up on the invoices yet? Oh, we have not done anything with that yet. No. Mm -hmm. That brings up a good point, though. And I I did not point this out: the checks or APs and ARs or ARs, is you can set up your own check setup. So you can move, you, the stubs can be whatever you want, whatever information you want on the stubs. Um, it can be, you can set up the format, so you buy your checks, it could be stub, stub, check, 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 three checks in a row. It could be stub, check, stub. That's up to you. We also have the option of printing on blank check stock, which means you do have to have micro font and your banks may require magnetic ink, even though they seem to be getting away from magnetic ink. But there is a possibility where you have one check stock and for every bank account you set this blank check form and it prints the microcoding and everything for you so that you don't have to have separate check stock for all your different checking accounts. Um, on the AR invoices and statements, you are able to um, format those as you'd like. You can add a small logo 
um, have the top of it look however you want, have the detail um, as, as detailed as you want with different descriptions, not long descriptions yet, but you have the short descriptions, quantity, weight, stuff like that on your, on your invoices and statements, um, fully customizable and all that. They're not super hard to do. Once you get used to it, it's not that bad. Um, it's a little daunting when you first go into any kind of setup for the checks because it is, um, <coughs> it really reminds me of like a DOS prompt when you're setting up these checks and stuff like that. Um, let's go check setup. So this is the check setup screen. You guys add fields in here. So this is kind of very undescriptive, but I do have some literature that helps. <coughs> helps you set up these screens and I can I help as well set up checks and um, and all that because it takes some finessing to get the spacing just right to match up if you have pre-printed checks this takes some finessing to get all the fields to match up correctly on the, on the checks okay um, so we've, we went over some of these as I went through them, but there are um, some of the reporting you're going to use for your accounting entries as a check register reconciliation, which we uh, briefly discussed. Um, it's one report, check register or a reconciliation. And again, what determines if it's a reg register reconciliation is this date range uses check date. If I have the box checked, it is a register, handwritten register by date of check. Everything is listed in check date order. So we have three, one, five, you know, goes down numerically on your check date or deposit date. If I uncheck that box, it goes by date cleared, it changes it to a reconciliation. So it goes by date cleared, um, matches your bank statements. You can reconcile to your bank. So we're over here by, by clear date, not necessarily check date. Um, Again, when you run these reports, you can right click on anything here and it brings you to the original entry. So you can edit if need be, or if you just want to look at it and look at the descriptions, um, or your long description here. If you had a long description, you can go there and look at the long description. This report, if you scroll over here to the right, does show the long description. If it had a long description, it would be over here in this far right col column here. Um, the other report for basic accounting that I use a lot is a user defined report. And I use it because you have all these search criteria, date, ledger account, center, division, vendor, description, entry type. I can choose any of these so I can look at just all my checks. I'm just going to bring them all up. Only checks. I could choose only deposits, only journal entries. Once you get the entries based on the criteria on the parameter screen, you also have a recap option on this report. So I can recap by my ledger account and see I had, of my checks, um, 22,000 was to land rent, negative 24,000 was to First Commonwealth, which is a bank, um, and then I had uh, 2,500 to my accounts payable, paying accounts payables. I can toggle this though, and recap it by center. So I can say that 22,000 of it was to 2016 soybeans. I can also recap Recap by division. There was only one division used, number one. You can recap by description. So um, 25,000 was paying APs. Uh, there was another entry here for some kind of first half payment on, on something there. Um, you can recap by description, or vendors, I'm sorry. So we have the Conklin Dairy here. If I had more, more vendors, ADM must not be on my desk. Um, the vendor list for something it's not pulling up for as, as an approved vendor there. And then we come back to ledger account there. Um, so there's a lot of options here. This report also, I probably don't have anything scanned. No. If I had anything scanned and if I attached a document, it would show a yes in the scan column. I could right click on that yes and bring me up just that image for that, for that entry. It does tell me who um, if you have a network situation and you usually have uh, security, which means you have usernames and passwords, it will show you who put that entry in and who edited that entry with their username here. All of these columns that you see, and this also is for any report, 
you can move around. So if I didn't need to know the number, I could right click it like a, like a spreadsheet. Click it around. I don't need to know my center number, I just want the description. You can, you can do a lot here with making the report look how you want it to look uh, by moving, my moving columns around. Um, also, just go over some basics of the reports down here at the bottom that you see here. Uh, obviously, print prints the report. Anything that is in black, can you see this is in black, this is in blue? Anything in black that has a, the colored and back bars will print. Anything that is in blue that is fighted out behind will not print. So you can change some things like uh, under printer setup, I could change, it's currently landscape, but you could change it to portrait or you could change it to legal um, to get more in the print range. Um, you can also choose this range button. And it lets me say, you'll see the top of it move from black to blue. So if I only wanted to print, I didn't want to print these debit and credit lines, I could click here. I'm only gonna print the top part. It's not gonna print any of this down here. I could do uh, columns as well. I could change what columns I wanted to print. So the whole report's up there, but I only want to print through division. So I clicked on my division. The stuff in blue is not going to print. So you can change what prints based on that range button. Again, I mentioned the printer setup. Uh, you can pick which printer it's going to print to. You can pick your font, your font size, um, your paper size and orientation, how many copies, um, and double side printing. Some of this stuff that's on this print setup, though, will be overwritten by however you have your actual printer set up. So it's kind of, you know, like, especially double-sided printing. I can click this, but it probably won't set on my, our, our um, printer and the office won't do double-sided printing, so it wouldn't, wouldn't print double-sided. Okay. Um, export, so you can, you have this report here, um, but you want to send it to somebody who doesn't have FBS. You can save it as an Excel file and email it to them. So I can hit this export button one way I can do it and I can tell it to save it as a text file or Excel. I can name it. I can tell it where I want to save it to. So I can save it anywhere on my hard drive um, where I can find it later to send an email. The other way though is from this screen, if I wanted to only send what was in black, I would hit F10. If I wanted to send my entire report to Excel, I'd hit F11 says it sends it to my clipboard, I can open up Excel, paste it in Excel, make your changes, save it, email it wherever you want it to go. Okay. Um, refresh means if you made any changes, you right click, you made a change in an entry, you click refresh, and you see the changes right away. Uh, and we talked about the, the toggling the recap on there. I like this report, it's again the user defined report because I can really narrow down what I'm looking for here. Um, by, I said by any of these criteria, um, it, it just it's, it helps it helps you find reports or helps you find entries. It also is, is really useful different kinds of accounting reports. But it's not the only ones. You obviously also have um, for your accounting reports a ledger account detail, which just lists based on ledger account you picked. It lists every entry that meets that cr the criteria here, um, ledger account range, um, division range. You don't have an option for centers on this one because it's a ledger account detail report. Uh, cost profit center is your center report. So you pick what centers you want to run and it's going to run um, entries for that center. Center zero, if I had any, any other centers, and we see the li they're listed and recapped by the center over on the left. You can kind of see that. Um, I don't use those top two very often. I use the check register and user to find a lot. Ledger account summary is similar to ledger account detail, except it's no detail, it's just, just summary. Bank account summary again goes up through all your bank accounts and tells you what your beginning checks, deposits, ending is. Trial balance, income statement, balance sheet, of course, are your basic financial reports you're going to use for um, the accounting process. And some of these will, re will be covered in the next one, so I don't want to go too in detail to them. Um, these don't allow you to pick ledger accounts, but you can pick on center and divisions. There's different columns you can include based on, on what you want or how you want that viewed. Um, you can get to set your beginning dates. You can select to have um, 
you can have each column being a different month, you can have each column being a whole year and compare year to year across your income statements. Um, trial balance, the only difference between the trial balance and like the balance sheet is the trial balance is a combination of income statement and balance sheet where you have all your income and expense at the top and then your assets and liabilities and equity at the bottom. Where the balance sheet is only assets, liabilities, and equity and income statement is only income and expense. So we'll run a quick trial balance here and show you that. So again, you have your income and your expense, and then you have your assets and liabilities if you had any equity accounts down here. It does tell you if you're out of balance. So for the period, um, I am out of balance on, on this, this one. I have a net change of 27,521. <coughs> okay. Are there any questions about your basic entries or when you would use them? I'm going to let's have a 10 minute break between this one and the next one, which is essential accounting reports. We'll go more in depth on the uh, income statement, balance sheet, trial balance, and all those other reports um, that we just covered there, but we'll go a little more in depth on all of them in the next session. Or um, Dean Dozman will be doing the exporting to ACH file and direct depositing and the other.